Be Beneath You Beautiful podcast is raw and intimate, sometimes funny, and always entertaining. With new episodes every Saturday, Hara explores our loves, fears, and hopes with a delicious combination of depth and lightness. Today, we interview Chris Angel. And Chris, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'd love to. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Hara, for having me. Mm-hmm. I live in Spokane. I've been here since 2007. And uh, I moved here to run a real estate company. Did that for five years. Before that, I was selling real estate in the Puget Sound. Before that, I was pursuing a master's in education, but hated sixth graders. And so <laughs> decided not to do that anymore. I think I wanted to make a difference for people, for kids. But uh, I, th- I think when I put the label teacher on me, uh, that got in the way of the kind of relationship I wanted to have with, with young minds. Interesting, I got into real estate and I didn't really have a passion for selling houses, but I found myself teaching adults and I loved that. I love humans. Mm -hmm. I love the heart of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, as much as my business career in 20 years has taken me towards marketing and systems and things like that, I just keep coming back to the heart and soul of people. Mm -hmm. So That's awesome. Yeah. We met at a mastermind group. Is that what it was? Yeah, it was like a networking group a couple of years ago that I had started. And um, I, I think you came as a guest. Yeah, I did. Yeah. But I've seen your posts on Facebook and I just feel a kindred spirit in your approach at looking at life honestly and reflectively. And and now you're my guest because I feel the same way. <laughs> so you don't do that anymore. Since 2011, I've been doing my own consulting work. So I do business consulting with a spiritual angle on it. I think you can't separate the two and uh, or the people that are attracted to the work I do are at a crisis of belief of some sort, like they've done it the way they've always done it. And they're wanting something more congruent in their life. I think my type of people are fiercely independent. Mm -hmm. They are rebels at heart because they've been there. They like, they won't drink Kool-Aid. They just won't have somebody tell them how, how easy it is. Like we've been there and done that. We know it's not like that. And so my people hate BS. So that's what I do now. I work with people who want a more honest approach to business. And that's what I do now. They're business people, but they're, it's like coaching. Is that right? Is it? Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Um, And it's coaching around, I would say marketing. I used to say marketing, but I think so many people have triggers around the word marketing, you know? And everybody's an expert. I know. Yeah. Yes. I heard this phrase the other day called bro marketing. And I thought that was hilarious. (laughs) I was like, yes, no more bro marketing. Uh, Yeah. So much of what I work on with people is finding the message that they have for the world. When you care about people and you want to make change in the world, ultimately that what what I equate that to is you have something you want to say, like you have a particular way you see things. And that to me is a conversation that you get to lead. So much of my work in coaching and consulting and business deals with like, what conversation are you leading in the world? Mm -hmm. Um, Like, for example, this show is such a great example of that, like see beneath your beautiful, like that's a conversation to lead in the world. Mm -hmm. I love that. And um, how do we talk about that with people? Right. That's what I feel passionate about. Yeah. How do people find you? And then what kind of things do you help them with? Or how do they find their message? The easiest way to find me is just on Facebook. Just search Chris Angel. You know, when I start in a coaching call with somebody about finding their message, the question I always start with is, what do you already know about the conversation you're here to lead in the world? I say it that way because most of us get stuck with the parts we don't know. We're like, well, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know what my message is. And I'm like, yeah, but there are some things you do know. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's just, you know, who it's not for. Like, I know that it's not for this group of people. And I know that it's not for that group of people. And I know it's not for these people. That's stuff that, you know, so it's like turning over a puzzle Mm -hmm. and you got to turn the pieces over before you start putting it together. Cause you need to see where the colors and the shapes fit, you know? Yeah. Nice. And as we go down, what's interesting is I start to hear the heart of the person and the the, the common thread through it all. And then we start to, it starts to form a picture, you know, Mm -hmm. that makes me think of Hertz's campaign. We're number two, but we try harder. They knew they weren't number one, Mm -hmm. but they used it to their advantage in their marketing. You know, it's all contrast. I really like Abraham Hicks as a a source of information and um, perspective. And I think contrast is really helpful. What are you not good at? And the more you start to explore, you go, oh, yeah, I'm not good at this, but I am good at that. You know, And I think also what's interesting is in this journey of finding your message, you start bumping up against all the things in the shadow all the limiting beliefs, all the disempowering chatter that happens in the mind. You're like, ah, but who am I to say this? And absolutely. I'm not that person out there on a pedestal, Mm -hmm. you know, and we bump up against all these things we have about who we think we are. 
are the people that are coming to you mostly want to be coaches themselves or they're just regular entrepreneurs? Most of my people are life coaches, healers, Okay, you know, think holistic practitioners in order for us to get along, they'd have to have some spiritual perspective about things, you know, before I realized that I was also a dreamer and it wasn't for everybody else only. Mm. And that my voice mattered and I could do this platform to help everybody else have a voice. Mm -hmm. All I was, was a graphic designer trying to make a buck, Mm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that so many people are on a journey now. Maybe I'm just open to it or aware of it more now, but they're really on a journey of helping others and self-discovery. Do you think that's happening more or am I just noticing it more? It's probably a little bit of both, but I I definitely think um, collectively the world is waking up, if you want to say it that way. I think you can see it in words, that trend. If you went to like Google keyword research or you looked at Google Trends, words like the word authenticity has been used a ton in the last several years compared to the last 20 years before it. Oh, yeah. Authors like Brene Brown, whose work has been super resonant with people. Yeah. These things that are becoming popular are just signs. They're pointing to this awakening. There's some interesting stuff I've been reading lately or listening to lately about um, spiral dynamics. Do you know about spiral no, dynamics? No, explain. I didn't either, but it's it's about levels of consciousness and how if you go way, way, way back to how we were as a species where our initial consciousness was food, survival, safety, and then it expanded and expanded. Like we can see, like it's just going to happen. You can't stop it. The evolution of our consciousness is going to keep expanding. And this is why I'm so passionate about people finding their message, because the more that we begin to share from our own authentic and raw experiences, the more we all stop comparing ourselves to everybody else. And we just embrace who we are. And and from that, we, our consciousness expands faster, you know? Mm -hmm. I just interviewed somebody who was talking about kids there, help parents understand that their kids are intuitive and try not to dissuade what they're passionate about. Love that. Each one of us has a purpose. And even though we're all so different. Yeah. So do you think that? My thoughts over the years have shifted. I like the belief that we are spiritual beings having a minor physical experience that I'm spirit first on the heels of that. I love the idea that as a spirit, I'm picturing myself hanging out in the ethereal spaces, looking down at earth. And I'm like, Hey, I'm going to hold my beer. I'm going to go live this life for 80 years, hundred years. Oh, cool. Yeah. And so maybe uh, up in that space before I incarnated in this body, I was like, this is what I want to do with this lifetime. Mm -hmm. And then I came down and, and I don't know what happens in the birthing process, but we forget all of that. Mm -hmm. we become babies and we forget all that. And then it's our job to remember, like we get to go down the path of remembering. And I think along the way, we get these little clues and the clues come from our heart. Like, what is your heart drawn to? And those are little symptoms of like you coming back to remembering like the life you wanted to live, you know? Yeah. And that would be the purpose. I used to think in college, I I would call those my Christian days. I don't really fit in that description anymore, but um, I used to be so concerned with God, what's your will for my life? You know, like you ask about purpose and I just had it so black and white and so one way. And as I've expanded my own thinking and uh, my own thoughts, I, I don't think it's so much about any one way. I think we get to kind of do what we want with this life, your purpose and the place to look in your heart is, or the place to look is in your heart. It's interesting that in my twenties, as much as those were my, my quote unquote Christian days, there's, I think there are all kinds of clues to what we wanted to do with our life when we were younger. Mm -hmm. In college, I would say I wanted to be a professional friend. (laughs) Like I want to be paid to be people's friends because I just loved hearing about what people were up to in life and wanted to support them in that. And and I think it's funny that 20 years later, I'm actually coming back to finding ways to do that. Like I obviously wouldn't put that on a business card. I'm a professional (laughs) friend, but but in a lot of ways, that's what a coach is doing is finding ways to dig into to life and saying, how do I support you and being the best that you are? Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. I just turned my heart off for 20 years. Right. Well, I feel the same way. As a kid, I always had a camera. High school, I had my own dark room in my bedroom. I mean, I was passionate. I've never not had a camera with me. And then after I got married and we moved up here when I was 23, I sold my dark room and I gave up photography, really. And then I went to a conference in 2019 and it was about dreamers. All of a sudden, I was like, oh, well, what about me? Why does everybody else get to be a dreamer and not me? Mm. And the next weekend, I went to a conference for women over 50 and I kept taking selfies with this woman. 
and she hated every photo of herself. And I said, oh my gosh, you look so beautiful. After this, can I take pictures of you to show you your beauty? And that's how it all started again. Wow. And so the same thing for 20 years, 30, 30 years, I wasn't doing photography. And now I feel like I'm coming home to what I Mm. I always knew about myself is sort of what you're saying also. So you're saying you were religious in your 20s. Did you grow up with that? No, my mom was a Methodist by nature, by, by her upbringing, um, became a Unitarian. My dad was a human, kind of a humanist guy, you know, no religion. Um, very intellectual, went to Yale, like, you know, just very cerebral. I grew up in Portland. So, you know, keeping it weird in Portland, I ended up going to a Southern Baptist youth group of all things in Portland, Oregon, because I was invited by a friend. I didn't have a lot of friends as a kid. I was a good floater. Like I could be in a lot of different groups. I was a chameleon, but I never really had any close friends. So I, there was something about being in a youth group that just made me feel connected and seen. And, Mm -hmm. and that was really valuable to me. And so that's actually how I ended up becoming a Christian was just, you know, through all the things that you hear in youth group and whatnot. I I think the thing that tipped me over the scales was I felt like they all had joy and I I don't feel like I really had a sense of joy. So I, that was the thing that had me become a Christian in in high school and then was one of these on fire guys for another six to eight years. And then the church I helped grow out of college, I helped grow a Gen X church and um, it was pretty exciting and all these fun things, but just got stabbed in the back from the pastor and people that had become my friends in that church and it, things got weird. And so my wife and I left that community. It was our whole, it was, you know, it was our whole community, our friends and everything. Yeah. Now I just sit call. We we've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years and doing our own thing. And it's great. Cause I actually feel closer to, if you want to use the word God, if you want to use the word universe consciousness, like I just feel closer to my source than I've ever felt before. And it doesn't have all the, the rules on it. So, uh, and I think that has me get to know myself more, you know, I think God is love. I, th- I think humans in, in our desire to understand things, put words around it. I think that's a good thing to have words for our experiences. And I think those words at certain levels of consciousness, those words turn into religion. Those words turn into a way to organize ourselves as a tribe around these things we say we believe. And in the beginning, that's exciting. Mm-hmm. You know, in the beginning, we're like, hey, we have this thing we have in common and let's find ways to meet around it and let's talk about it and learn about it. And then over time, I think our egos kick in and we start to try to control things and just look at 2000 years of Christianity. And you looked at like how it's expanded, whether it was through crusades or whatever else, like uh, how it was canonized, how, like who, did, who got to say what, what books went in the Bible. Like you start to look at all the ways that ego and power played a role in. I mean, if you're, if you're all in on, on the way it is, then, then this would be offensive and triggering. But if you are the person who doesn't want to say the, all the thoughts you have, because you're afraid of the backlash you would get from all the thoughts you have, like then this conversation, I mean, this is a great conversation because God is love. Years ago, I read this book called Your God is Too Small by J.B. Phillips. It was one of the really small books. He was the guy that wrote the Phillips translation of the Bible. And it was just all, you know, all about like the way we think about God is too small. In the Tao, it says like the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. Like for you to be able to say that God is this way ceases to have it be God because you can't put God in two words. Mm-hmm. We can try, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't, it's not the whole thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. The whole point for me is to have a real conversation and I assume we will offend some people and excellent. Then maybe I'll have another conversation with that person and know what they think and believe. What I like best about me is that I'm open to everything. Like I think, oh, your religion sounds good and your religion sounds good and no religion sounds good. So go and do (laughs) <laughs> do what works for you. Yeah. I love that. Do you have any cool stories about somebody transforming in some way or? Everybody's unique, I think in some ways, but the common experience of people coming through my programs is who they know themselves to be. Mm-hmm. Most of my people coming into my programs are confident business people. They're, they're self-aware and dot, dot, dot. There is this thing about what start when I created this program, my, my current program two years ago, it was started off as a marketing program trying to help people be more authentic in marketing. You know, that was the whole thing. But two years into running these programs, what I've noticed is that more than marketing, it's a, it's a healing program. That's really interesting to me because there's something about when people speak their truth, they find their power. And we spend so much time speaking what we think people want to hear and not actually saying what's true for us. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people who are self-aware in their personal life and their spiritual life, when it comes to trying to be marketers or business people, we often 
feel incongruent, out of sync with, out of alignment with who we are because we're trying to do what we think marketers are supposed to do. So it's pretty consistent experience to see people come through the program, begin to share from their lived experience. And in the process of sharing that lived experience, wrestle with all the chatter and doubts and limiting beliefs, and then come out the other side doing many posts from their lived experience. They're trusting themselves more. It's not that they become anybody else. It's actually that they become more of who they are. They're embracing more of who they are by speaking their truth. And that's that's incredible. I love that. That is so cool. One of the things that I've noticed is that you've been lately at least questioning yourself. Is that right? Yeah. What are you questioning yourself about? And what are your limiting beliefs? Last summer, I was doing some hypnotherapy with James Barfoot in Spokane. And one of the things that came up for me was that that unearthed itself was just this anger. I just had anger. I'd been using anger for a long time in my life to produce results. You know, like it was the taskmaster in my mind that said, sit your ass down and get to work. So that's what you mean is you were angry at yourself. Is that what you're saying? I mean, I suppose. Yeah. I suppose there are some angry at myself, angry at other people, angry at like things not going my way, just angry. Just, I think part of that, if I go back to my college years, I was this kid with this huge faith and loved everybody. And I, I didn't care about the systems of things. I was so present in the moment of things and I had so much joy in my twenties. And then I got into business as as a real estate agent and thought, you know, naively so probably that I was going to make millions of dollars in a matter of months, which is totally what somebody with big faith would do. You'd be like, yes, let's go. Like I'm giving my heart to it all. And then, you know, I depleted my savings in three months. I didn't sell a house for nine months. I was newly married. So my marriage was like on the rocks with my wife being scared and uncertain of what all this was. And I think somehow I just decided like faith is a bad business plan. You know, Mm -hmm. having all sorts of unbounding faith doesn't get it done. (laughs) I just put my head down and was like, get to work. And so every time I would find myself straying off or thinking people were going to call me a dreamer, you know, dude, your head is in the clouds. You just see, you just have rose colored glasses. Like you have no, no foundation in reality. These are the thoughts in my head. To me, that was just a voice of anger, just chattering, chattering, chattering. I sit your ass down and get to work. So So I did it for 20 years and um, I saw that last summer and I saw it as a lid. I'm like, I have really big goals, but I think this anger is a lid on what I'm able to produce. And it served me to this point in my life and and that it's helped me show up and maybe in a time when I otherwise wouldn't have shown up. But I decided I'm not going to use anger as the energy to move things forward. And so I took my hands off of anger. I wasn't going to go fix it because I think fixing it is just more anger in a different skin. I think it's like, well, we're going to fix it now. So I was like, I'm not going to fix it. I'm taking my hands off and I'm going to surrender to whatever this thing, this new thing is. The hard part about surrender is you don't control it. Mm -hmm. So I'm still in that space of like investigating my beliefs, investigating. I realized within the last month, like, I don't know that I actually have a personal philosophy about things personal philosophy about life or personal philosophy about business or like all the things. I'm like, I'm not sure what my compass is. That doesn't mean you don't have a message. What do you think a philosophy mean? What is the difference? Well, I think a philosophy of life, at least for me, would be something where I say, oh, this is how life is. This is how life works. This is what it means to me. And then I can organize my life around that. You know, I I guess it almost goes back to how I described religion. Like we have these experiences and we start to use words to describe them and we build dogma and and, um, rituals around these things. I guess I'm wanting to do that for myself because everybody else's thing um, is not my thing. Like everybody else's philosophy that they've put into words is not my own understanding. So I'm, Mm -hmm. that's part of the thing I'm questioning is like, how does Chris see the world, you know? Yeah. Isn't it kind of exciting though, that it's all a discovery still, and you're still get to, you just keep figuring it out. In some ways it's more exciting now, you know, I think this is part of the hero's journey. If I put it in that context, I think everybody goes through the, this moment where it's like, who do you say you are? Like, I think I'm in the space of who does Chris say? I've spent a lot, I, (laughs) the last, uh, in the last six months or so, I had this realization, like that I put some words to, like, I've been a perpetual seeker. Mm -hmm. I always wore seeker as a badge of honor. Like I'm a seeker of truth. I'm a seeker of what's true, but to put perpetual seeker on it, kind of like just describes the sting of it a little bit more because you're always almost there. You're never there. There's no end goal though. I mean, I don't think you're ever going to be there. I just interviewed my 25 year old daughter and she kept saying, I can't wait till I'm 30, but mm-hmm. everything's going to change. And I'm like, what do you expect to just magically <laughs> change? That's great. And then there was this picture of my mother at her 40th birthday that I have. She passed away when I was 18. So I just held on to this 40th birthday picture and she's so sophisticated opening this gift. And I 
waited my whole life to be 40 and sophisticated. That just never happened. Mm. There's not a magic moment. So I think you're kind of doing the same thing. Do you think so? Doing the same thing with what? Like Like that there's this going to be this, you're going to aha, and that's going to, you're going to know it all. I don't think that's going to be the. I think that was in seeing the perpetual seeker thing. I think that was part of it was like, a, like, what was I seeking? I think what I was seeking was a moment. I think I was seeking the sophistication. I think I was seeking the thing, the, yeah. the destination. And I think realizing that you're always almost there is the down, it's the, it's the, the letdown. It's the, you know, you just peed in my Wheaties, like, <laughs> you know. I think perpetual is beautiful though. Do you know Byron Katie? Oh, I love Byron Katie. Yeah. She's 78, I think, and still does her worksheets. So, I mean, she's not, she doesn't think she knows it all or knows the answers. You know what I'm saying? I just don't think there's an end where I think perpetual seeker is a beautiful phrase. I like your take on it. I think the way I was thinking of it was just the upset you get when you're attached to an outcome and Mm -hmm. you will constantly be stuck in upset and because you're perpetually seeking a destination and it's never a destination. It's always a journey and an unfolding. Exactly. I describe it often as moving from certainty to uncertainty. Like I think life is a constant game of expansion Mm -hmm. and I think life moves from certainty. And as you expand, do you have uncertainty now in this new expansion? And then if you live in uncertainty long enough, you start to find places of certainty and you you get comfortable in this expanded version. And then if you're going to live the life of expansion instead of your safe you know, comfort zone, you're going to expand and you're going to be in uncertainty again. And this is a lot of the embracing of that. I think I'm just seeing that now. I'm like, I'm more interested in the expansion. So I'm willing to be uncomfortable in the uncertainty. And by the way, that's why my posts are, that's why I'm so willing to be candid about the questions I ask in life and put it on loudspeaker for people because I think that's the game. And I think anybody that thinks you get to certainty and then for the rest of your life, you're certain hasn't lived life long enough. Like you missed the whole game. All right. I think so too. I love that. And I'm surprised at how often, not only do I learn something new, but the same lesson over and over. Again. <laughs> yeah. That's really, really right. annoying. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. That is annoying. Oh my God, I knew that once. Looking into different ways that people uh, talk about bringing change and transformation to the world, that the idea that we have to change ourselves first, like the only way to change the world is to change ourselves first. And I think that, I think that's really important. I think kids kind of are getting that right now. And I think adults like, uh, like my, my generation, we're trying to figure that out still, like taking radical responsibility for my life, the way I see things, that is the only way the world changes. And I think where we came from was a lot of, the things that were modeled for me as a kid were a lot of preaching, a lot of other people telling the world how it's supposed to go and not taking responsibilities where you found like all kinds of um, scandals and things of like people put on pedestals who ended up being, you know, less than what we thought they were. And maybe that was an unfair place to put them. But I think what is getting created now is this. And then why the reason I value transparency so much is there is no, perf- there's no perfect person. There is no perfect. Like, let's just be real about our flaws. This is why I'm okay putting my flaws on loudspeaker for people because I'm like, we're all this way. Right. You know, just own it. Stop pretending you're not. Right. I totally agree. What do you think about the words like transparency and authenticity? Oh, I love those words. To me, it's like when I say, tell a joke and then say, aren't I funny? Because you didn't get the joke. I feel like you don't have to say you're authentic and transparent because you obviously are like, you can just take those words right out of your vocabulary because you're living it and not preaching it. And so, boy, is it just annoying to hear people say how authentic they are. It's so overused. Uh, Yeah, I I understand. I get that. I understand what you're saying. I think um, so much of my work is addressing the issue. And so we're using the word authenticity it's meta because we're talking about the thing that needs to be authentic. It's like, look, you're not being authentic. This is what authentic would look like. Yeah. And trying to have a conversation and distinctions around what does authenticity mean so that we can be more of it. Yeah. I agree. Like to say like, Hey guys, have you seen my stuff? Like I'm pretty authentic. I'm pretty amazing. You should check out my authentic stuff. You're saying it jokingly, but I've literally heard that before. Like people say that for real. You don't have to say it if you're actually doing it. This is why I love the conversation of spiral dynamics and consciousness, levels of consciousness, because you'll see the intellect 
you see people starting to understand like, oh, authenticity is getting some play. And so then they start to use the word to be included in part of this. It's a trend. And so people are trying to, to play in the trend of things rather than just embodying the, the, what it is. This is where you get lip service to stuff. And so how does how do your coaching things work? Do you have group coaching? Do you have one on one? Most of my stuff is group stuff now. Mm-hmm. I, for those that want to pay for it, I do one-on-one coaching, but it just, it costs more. So most people don't, don't do that. But yeah, I really like group coaching because it creates community in the process of doing it. Mm-hmm. And the conversations that come out of it are also very rich. I like group coaching around a particular path to, j- it's not just like, Hey, let's all hang out and then see where the conversation goes. Like there's actually a, we're meeting for a purpose, which is how do we find our message? I also teach, once you have a message like teaching coaches and healers, how do you create a program online that delivers the transformation that you're wanting to bring the world? Designing and delivering an experience like that's really important. So that there is a curriculum or a path um, that we're on. I really like coaching that way because it, it feels like we're going somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. Just like everybody has a conversation that they already can lead in the world. Like life has already taught you enough that you could lead a conversation in the world. You also have enough life experience to, to create a curriculum, a, a program, a path for people based on what you've already lived. Most people just don't know how to codify that or decode it to be like, what is my path? I don't know how I got here. I just lived yeah. it. But when I ask you enough questions that get you to see like, oh, wow, well, first I would do this and then they would do this and then it would, you actually would put it into a sequence. Yeah. What would be the easiest way to do it? You totally could have a sequence for it. And I think that's really fun when people start to see light, light bulbs go off for like, oh, like I actually do have a process. I thought I didn't have a process, but I actually do have a process. Wow. And interesting why people don't lead. Like a lot of my people, we tend to get in a space of we've been hurt by leaders or uh, we've been hurt by the ones who have all the answers. And so we actually, our pendulum swings the other and we're like, well, I'm not going to be the one that says I have all the answers. And so we actually go the other way. I understand the heart of it because I've been in that space. But I also think there's something about owning our inner leader. Like there's value in leading something. And it doesn't mean you're better than, it doesn't mean you're on a pedestal, but there's, you can be a leader. And in fact, people are looking for someone who is safe, you know, leaders that are safe. Mm -hmm. I finally feel that way, but probably for about a week now of my whole life Mm. where I feel like I can step into my power Mm. and that the limiting belief of I'm, I'm the stupid one because my sister was the gifted one. Mm. Yeah. And I don't know anything. And it's best if I say nothing. Mm. Wow. I feel really excited about embracing whatever power I have. I would not have said that two weeks ago. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah. I really love that too. It's so cool how you keep growing. Like I love that. That's what I'm saying. There's no end result. I don't know what's going to happen next week. That's different than this week, but I'm so excited to see. I think that's our uh, collectively as humans. I think that's our path to something new, you know, is when we all embrace our inner leader, you'd have to get to a space where you could own yourself as a leader. Yeah. And whether you lead or not, isn't even in the issue. It's like that you could see yourself as a leader is some, in some way you acknowledging the gifts and the uniqueness that you have and that you have value. Mm-hmm. And until you get to that spot, you're going to keep looking outside yourself as everybody else has value or the right answer. And I have the wrong answer. You're going to be stuck in a game of comparison the rest of your life. That's so true. Have you always felt that way about yourself? Or do you still question whether you're a leader? What do you, how do you feel about the word leader? I like it now. I don't know that I, I mean, I like it. I liked it when I was younger. I think I liked it for a long time. What I think that means has shifted. I think I went from like thinking John Maxwell and leadership books were like the whole, that was the holy grail of leadership. And now I'm like, I think that's maybe a, that's a, that's an angle on leadership, but Mm -hmm. I think I found leadership early on. I think uh, in life, like I know what that feels like. And I think my ego really liked that. It felt good to have people look up to you or Mm -hmm. want to be in your space and your energy of things. People line up to talk to you after events. And like, I liked that feeling. I still like that feeling. I love speaking on stage and at events. Like I I like that. Mm -hmm. My understanding of what it is shifted. And so like I say now to people, so many people distrust now, like there's so much skepticism and cynicism because everybody over promises and under delivers on everything mm-hmm. that people, the people that ultimately you could be leading just don't trust. And I, so I think what people are looking for are safe people. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. safe leaders. And in, and in finding a safe leader, they want to know, can you give me safe passage from where I'm stuck to where I want to go? And I think, I think a leader's job is to provide that safe passage, you know, and I think that shifted because it really put me in touch with the responsibility of the process. I think leadership is more than saying smart things or heartfelt things. I think being a leader is being willing to be in the trenches with people to provide safe passage, you know? that's what causes me to trust other leaders who are safe is like, you're willing to go through the work and be transparent about your process and not over promise and, or, or say you have all the answers when in fact you don't like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really love that. I think leadership used to be a thing that was like, Oh, they have the answers. And I think leadership now is, Oh, they're willing to do the work. Yeah. Like you're willing to be with me through the process that, that to me feels like a good leadership thing. I really think that's true. The people I look up to, in terms of leaders are also asking questions and just listening, not necessarily providing answers, which is fascinating. Yeah. Even Byron Katie, she never tells you, you always have to come to it on your own. And it's always, is it true for you? I love that. And that feels safe to me. Right. That is. Yeah. It's very safe because nobody's telling you how to think or feel. Well, that's so interesting. I love that. There's something about, um, I think this is happening in consciousness. I think we're waking up to there is no perfection. I don't know why I always think of like TV and newscasting, but you go to like the green room and then the makeup room and all the lights with the vanity mirror and all the makeup and all the, like we did all these things to look so put together Mm -hmm. that now I think like I I almost distrust things that look overly done because I'm like, yeah, this isn't the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And I think the more transparent we are, if we go back to the word transparency, the more transparent we are, the more it provides that space of safety, you know, like this is real, this is safe, this feels good to me. And I think this is where we get to be leaders of each other and not look to like the leader up there on stage. We get to lead one another, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, that reminds me, do you know Ram Das? Mm-hmm. He had this quote that I love. We're all just walking each other home. I love that. I think that's what leadership is. Like leadership is us walking each other home. Oh, I love that. There's a really cute picture of a little boy helping a a little girl with her rain slicker and that quote. And that just makes, warms my heart. That's all we're doing, right? I love that. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I think that levels the playing field on leadership. Yeah, that's so good. Thanks. Is there a book that you would recommend to people or that you love or that made a difference in your life somehow? On the spiritual side of things, I really like The Heart of the Soul from Gary Zukoff. I also like The Surrender Experiment from Michael Singer. On the business side of things, I really like Tribes from Seth Godin. I really like Good to Great from Jim Collins. Those are awesome. Thank you. For somebody struggling with perfection, do you have any advice? There's no way around it. You got to go through it. I bump up against this all the time. And when people come into my programs is, there, there's always some standard in their head that's better than what they can produce in their own content. So if a written post, a video post, it's never good enough when they start. Mm-hmm. They have a more perfect standard in their head for what they think it's supposed to be. Yeah. And the only way through is to iterate. Yeah. It's repetition after repetition after repetition of sucking you know, whatever you think you should be perfect at and you're not, you then you just need to do repetitions and, and just embrace how, how bad you are. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, maybe in the process of that, don't try to become better at something you don't care about. Oh, yeah. Good one. Yeah. I think a lot of people set their ladders up against the wrong wall because they're not clear about what do I really want to do here? But once you get clear about what you want to do here and the difference it will make for other people, there's enough future pull. There's enough why in it to endure the suckiness of it. Mm-hmm. That's really good. The thing that makes it okay to suck and be visibly sucky to people is that you're the brave one taking the first step. Like you're the one showing others it's okay to not be perfect. Like that's what it takes for the rest of us to realize that we don't have to be perfect. Also, it's by the way, it's why I share the way I share because I realize that if you can see me be imperfect, then you'll have permission to be imperfect as well. If I can take my mask off, it gives you permission to take your mask off. But if I leave my mask on, the only thing I produce in the world is perfect and I won't release anything or or share anything that isn't perfect, then you will feel constrained by my perfection and you won't show up 
unless you can feel as perfect or more perfect than my perfect. So this is the leveling of the playing field is like, we all need to start showing up in the messiness of our own lives because it gives others permission to do the same. And that's when we start to have an authentic exchange, like a real exchange with people. Right. I have no problem with being vulnerable because it's just not an issue, whatever. You can know all about me. But for you, I feel like it might be harder because you're coaching people and you're supposed to know better or know more. Do you think that's right? Yeah. I just appreciate that you're saying, I don't have all the answers, but let's figure it out together. What makes that okay for me as a coach to not have all the answers is like, I know that that's the game. No coach has all the answers. And any coach that says they do is puffing. They're posturing. They're afraid that you'll find out what they don't know. Right. One of the best coaches I've ever had helped me find my own answers. That's right. I was just going to say that. That's perfect. Yep. That's perfect. Somehow all the knowledge is in here, shockingly, that I have it all. I don't have your answers. Right. You have your answers. As a coach, my job isn't to give you the answers. My job is to point you to your own. Mm -hmm. When I teach my programs, one of the things I'll say is, hey, leading doesn't mean you have the answers. Sometimes leading is just leading from your own questions. Mm -hmm. Because if I can show you the questions I'm asking myself, it might cause you to think, oh, wow, like that's so refreshing that I could actually look at my own questions. Because why? Because that, that would lead you to your own answers. Right. I love that. And now it takes all the pressure off of me to be perfect or to have the answers or to, to, to know more than you. This right. isn't a game of knowing more. This is a game of knowing where to look for answers. And if I, I know where to look for answers for me. So if I can show you how I'm looking for my own answers, it might help you look for your own answers. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Well, this has really been a great conversation and I, I loved it. I'm so happy to know you more. Thank you for reaching out and inviting me. Yeah, of course. Well, Hera, thank you so much for um, having me on this conversation. And I, I really love what you're doing with this. It's so... Thanks. Thanks. The world needs more of this. I think so too. Okay. okay thanks. Bye. Yeah. Bye.